it's time for us to check back in with Alex Stewart and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, just look in the description below for a playlist. I suppose they just had to eat anything they could get. That's exactly right. It tickled them to death to catch a possum or a rabbit to eat. They never think about skinning a varmint like that before they eat it. They just take his insides out and put him over the fire and cook him, head, ears, feet, tail, and all. I can remember when they was half the people who lived right out of the woods eating varmints, nuts, pawpaws, haws, sarvis, mayapples, and such as that. They'd make it pretty good in the summer and fall, but along up towards Christmas, they was up against it. I'll tell you, they sure did see trouble. One feller, he lived right over yonder on that ridge, come over and begged Margie's daddy out of a cat. He took that cat home, killed it, and fed it to his family. Now he sure done that. He was a Collins. Well, when you get to thinking about it, a cat is a lot cleaner than a possum or even a chicken. They ain't no kind of old carrion that a chicken won't eat. You told me once, Alex, that some of the people you knew ate skunks or polecats. Oh, yes. Jim Johnson would eat every polecat he'd catch. Of course, he couldn't catch them in the summertime. He'd wait until the fall of the year when the fur was good, and he would skin them and get the hide, and then he'd eat the polecat. That's as good as meat as you ever eat. You've eaten it too? I eat just two bites. I used to catch them in the fall for their fur, and they'd be just as fat as mud. I'd take and render them out to get the oil. Now, you'd be surprised how much oil you'll get from a good fat polecat. You'll get over a pint. I was rendering some on the stove one time, and it just smelled so good and looked so good, and I said, I'm going to taste that. I got a leg out, and I declare that was the best piece of meat ever I laid in my mouth. If you know how to skin one, you don't get a bit of that scent on the meat. What did you use the polecat oil for? That's the best thing ever you put on leather. If you put it on a burn before it has time to blister, it'll never blister. It'll draw the fire right out, and it's good for croup. The kids used to be awful bad back then to take the croup, and they would be stopped up till they couldn't get their breath. You could take a teaspoon of that skunk grease and let them swallow it, and in a few minutes, it was all over with. Will it keep in a bottle or jar just like hog lard? Yeah, and it don't cake. I don't care how cold it gets, it won't cake. It's sort of yeller. It looks like castor oil. Why, they was people who'd come to our place from all around to get that polecat grease. People just did whatever they had to do to live. Now, there was an old fellow named Jim Mason who lived up on the ridge here, and he was in his corn crib one day shucking corn. They was a lot of rats in there, and he killed two or three, skinned them, and took them home and cooked them. He tried eating them, but he couldn't do much good at it. Said they were too strong. I suppose most people ate cornbread. Yeah, they was lucky if they had cornbread. They was very few folks that ever had any flour to make biscuits. A lot of folks had no bread at all. A lot of times they'd just parch corn and maybe roast some taters, even for breakfast. I don't know at the times people would come and want to borrow a few ears of corn to feed their family. Pap would always give them some, and I never did know of him charging anything for it. He always tried to manage so he'd have plenty of corn. Now, there was an old feller that used to live right here where I live now, and he made a crop one summer on nothing in the world but mustard and bread. That's what he eats, three meals a day, breakfast, dinner, and supper. He'd mix up his meal and just bury it in the ashes and cook it that way. Ash cake, they called it. He had three or four children, and they'd go out and pick green mustard, and that was their meal. They'd each have them a little gourd full of water to drink. I was passing by there one day and stopped to talk to him a minute. He was eating dinner. He said, you're welcome to come eat with me, but all I've got is green mustard and ash cake. He said, I wish I had more to offer you, but that's all we've had this spring. Back then, people would go out and dig up wild onions to eat. They was a family that lived up here on top of the ridge over a bluff. They was a lot of wild onions that growed at the foot of that bluff, and every day they would go down there and eat them wild onions. 
They're awful good for your heart, and they claim they're a good blood medicine, too. I guess a man would do almost anything to get food for his children if they were starving. Johnny Wilson lived way up on the back of Lou Trent's place, and he got up against it. He had nine or ten children, and they run out of corn one winter and had nothing for his family to eat. He got to slipping down to Lou's place at night and climbing up over the logs in his crib and stealing corn. Lou got to notice him one day, and he saw where the top of that corn was going down, and he set a big steel trap where they had been reaching through the cracks. That night, about 10 o'clock, Johnny went down to get some more corn, and he climbed up to the top of them logs and wrenched his hand in there and got caught in that trap. He was hanging up there by one hand and the other one in that trap and couldn't get down. He commenced hollering, Oh, Lou Trent! Oh, Lou Trent! Come and get me out! Lou heard him and come out and hollered back. He says, I'll come get you at daylight made that poor man hang there by one hand all night. When day come, he went and got him out and made him come up to the house and eat breakfast with him. Yes, sir, made him come and eat breakfast. Johnny said, I didn't do it because I was too sorry to work, but my children was hungry and I had to do something. Lou said, now you could have told me and I'd let you borrow some corn or give you some, but don't you never steal from me again. The next time, by God, I'll catch you with some buckshot. And then he let him go. Johnny liked to have lost that hand in spite of everything. He kept it tied up for I don't know how long, and when it did get well, his fingers were all crooked and twisted, and they stayed like that till the day he died. Lou give him a job cutting wood for him. Oh, at the wood that man would cut. He never stopped, and he was the choppinest man in this whole country. He cut, I guess, a thousand cords of wood for Lou. Lou got to liking him and trusted him with anything he had. He was honest in a way. He wasn't what you'd call a rogue. Johnny had seven boys, but they never worked like he did. There was a rail fence close to where they lived on Lou's place. And sometimes when it got right cold, they'd go outside and cut up them rails for firewood rather than go to the woods and chop down a tree. Old Lou would hear them, and he could tell by the sound when they was chopping rails. Yes, sir, it sounded a little different. He'd go up there and make it hard on them. He'd make them go to the ridge and split out rails and fix the fence back. Johnny claimed he couldn't do nothing with his boys. Lou said, I've raised a few boys too, and I'll be damned if they don't do what I tell them to do. I suppose there weren't many cooking vessels and not a lot of what we call silverware. No, the women and children just ate with their fingers. The men would use their pocket knives if they had one. They was a family that lived out the ridge from us that didn't have a cooking pot in the house. They'd cook their taters and corn in the fireplace in the ashes, and if they ever had a piece of meat, they'd just roast it over the fire. Pat brought the first tin vessel ever I seen. It was a little tin bucket that held a gallon. My grandmother, Stuart, didn't have a tin vessel in her house. The cups, knives, forks, spoons, pitchers, bowls, and everything else was made out of wood or gourds. Granny had a big gourd that she used to milk in. It had a hemp and flax rope for a handle. There wasn't a glass dish about the place and no glass in the windows. I tell people that now and they think I'm lying. I try not to misrepresent it, and if I do, it's because I don't know any better. My old friend Oscar Eli from Harlan County, Kentucky, has often told me about his great-grandfather raising his family in a big hollow tree. Did you ever hear of that? Yes, sir. There was an old woman named Liza Lamb. She had three or four young children and didn't have no place for shelter, and they lived in a big hollow poplar for a while. I've seen that tree many a time. It stood on the north side of the ridge back here. Poor old thing. She had a hard time feeding them kids. She'd come up to grandpaps and grandmas and want to wash for them. Grandma would just give her some taters or corn, whatever was ripe, and let her go on. She wasn't a good hand at washing. She could just barely get enough to keep her nakedness hid. Her children was just stringy-headed little old things, never no shoes, and half the time no clothes. It was just pitiful to look at them. They finally moved in a cave right up the ridge from where I lived. They called it the Brock Cave. 
The Bronx had lived in there at one time. Yeah, I've been back in that cave many a time. After you got back in there a ways, they was a pretty good sized room and that's where they stayed. After they moved out of that cave, people would go there to make music. They'd take their banjos and fiddles and have a big time. They'd go there about every Sunday. Music sounds good in a cave. I know that every family wasn't lucky enough to be located near a spring, especially those who lived on the ridge. Where did they get their water for cleaning, bathing, cooking, and so forth? About the only thing they used water for was cooking and drinking. In the summertime, they might go down to the creek and take a bath. In the wintertime, some of them would heat a little pan of water on the hearth and take a rag and wipe off a little bit. Oh, plenty of them never took a bath. I'll swear to God, I've seen children with their hands and feet so rusty, black, and cracked up where they'd get welts and crust on them that you couldn't tell if it was flesh or what. They would be just as black as that chimney jam right there, and their face and hands just about as bad. Oh, I've got so sorry for them, I could die might near it. In the spring of the year, the young girls would build a dam across this creek down here on my place so the water would be deep enough for them to take a bath. I was down there one day in the spring, and they was half a dozen girls there taking a bath, and them stark naked. Didn't pay no more attention to their hind ends showing than if they didn't have one. So when you were growing up, you didn't even have the old galvanized tubs? Oh no, they didn't come in for a long, long time. I can remember the first cake of store-bought soap that I ever saw. Lennox was the name on it. It was just as yellow as a pumpkin. You could use lye soap to wash in, but you had to wash it off right away. You couldn't put it on and stand around. It would sure eat your skin. Alex, considering the fact that many people had very little clothing, that the houses were so open, it seems that some of them would have frozen. Oh yeah, it was pretty regular back then. There was two or three women that froze to death right up there on the top of this ridge. I remember like it was yesterday when a woman and her two children froze to death. She lived in a little log house and it had no bed covers and no way to get wood for a fire. It come a real cold spell and they just froze to death. I realized that conditions were hard for everybody back then, but it seems that the women and children suffered most. Do you remember telling me years ago about the woman who cooked dinner for the field hands the day after giving birth to a child? Yeah, I recollect that. Mama had a sister that lived across on the other side of the mountain and she wanted to go see her. She got me to go with her to carry the baby. It was about six or seven miles over there and just before we got to where Mama's sister lived, we stopped at Dick Johnson's place to rest. Mommy knew Miss Johnson. Well, Miss Johnson was stirring around there getting dinner for a bunch of thrashing hands. Mama asked how she was feeling. She said, I feel pretty good considering I had a baby last night. Mama said, you did? Miss Johnson said, yeah, and I've got the afterbirth tied around my leg. Now that's the truth if I've ever told it. You've often talked about the scarcity of food and how many people didn't even have enough corn to eat. I presume that these extremely poor folks never had any livestock. A heap of folks, most of them that lived on top of the ridge, never had a cow, a hog, a mule, or no kind of stock. When I was a child in the Depression, I remember some poor mountain people who fattened hogs on certain kinds of weeds. They called them hog weeds. Did you ever hear of that? Oh yeah, there's plenty of weeds that will keep a hog. There's what's called a river weed that a hog will do well on. Parsley is awful good hog feed. Now you can sure fatten a hog on parsley. It has a little round leaf and grows pretty flat and low on the ground. You can get you an armload of it in a few minutes. It has a stem on it and is about as big around as your little finger. I've gathered it myself to feed hogs. I'd never heard of parsley and I thought Alex was referring to parsley or perhaps parsnips, which sometimes grow wild in this area. But neither parsley nor parsnips fitted the description Alex gave of the plant he called parsley. I must say that I'd begin to wonder if Alex had just thought up the name, but Webster's International Dictionary came to the rescue. Parsley is therein described as an annual herb with a fleshy, succulent stem. The more preferred spelling is parslant, 
We'll take off a half point from Alex's score for not using the preferred pronunciation. Alex continued his discourse on how hogs could be fattened without the use of domesticated crops. He pointed out that the plant, which is commonly called poke, is a good hog feed. Poke, as mentioned earlier, has always been a popular plant for human consumption in the early spring, especially in certain areas of the South. It is cooked often with other greens. These cooked greens were and are called poke salad, but I had never heard of it being used as hog feed. Oh, poke's good for hogs if you cook it. You take the stalks and you put a little salt in it and cook it, and buddy, them hogs will light in on it like it was corn, and it cleans the worms out of them too. When I lived on the Widow Mullins place on Blackwater, she kept hogs. That mountain was just full of poke, and she'd go every day and get her a load of that and cook it for her hogs. Boy, I've seen her pack the heaviest load of poke stalks out of the mountain many times on her hip. She had a big kettle she always kept to cook it in. She gave them about three messes every day. She had seven or eight pretty good hogs there at one time, and she mostly fattened them on poke. Well, when the weather become cool enough to preserve the meat in November, the hogs were butchered. I suppose so you didn't have the problem of wintering them, but what about feeding the cows and the horse stock through the winter when the corn was gone? Why, the few people that had cattle or horses used to winter their cattle might near it on winter grain. Right across Indian Ridge over there, the ground was covered with it. It growed a long, flat leaf. People would take sheets and sacks and go there and gather it to feed their cows. Law, I've seen them do that many a time. Poor old single Terry Johnson's daddy and mother would come out of that ridge carrying great bundles of that winter grain. And old man Mahoney, he'd go to the woods hunting it. Now there's four or five different kinds. One kind we called winter furrin. Then there's another kind that's called maiden hair. That's the prettiest thing ever you looked at. I just wish you had the time to go with me back up there on the ridge and I'd show you some maiden hair. Alex's unusual comment about the beauty of this plant is interesting. An encyclopedia on herbs and gardens describes the maidenhair fern, or A-D-I-A-N-T-U-M, as being among the most beautiful of greenhouse ferns. Alex's comments indicating that there was various types of wintergreen was also verified. The encyclopedia describes the types of wintergreen as shallon, checkerberry, teaberry, or Galutheria, Galutheria, and also states that it belongs to the Heather family. Alex continued discussing the problem people faced in providing food for their livestock under conditions where they could scarcely feed themselves. Back then, people didn't have no meadows, generally, and they didn't have any hay. They'd feed their stock a little corn, fodder, and shucks. You couldn't get a cow now to look at a shuck, let alone eat one. They would even feed them corn cobs. Yes, sir. Beat them up right good, boil them down in a kettle, and put a little salt on them. I've seen them do that many a time. Livestock were allowed to run loose at that time, weren't they? Oh, yes. They didn't have fence laws then. The folks that had livestock would put a brand on them and let them go. Grandpap had a big branding iron he used for his cows. He would notch or slit the ears of his hogs and sheep. He had to have his brand registered at the courthouse in Sneedville, and nobody else could use that brand. We fed our stock once in a while so they'd stay around, and we'd salt the cattle every few days, and that helped to keep them coming back. In the fall of the year, when the acorns began to fall, the hogs would get as fat as mud balls. The people today don't really know what a hard time their ancestors had, do they? The people that think they've got it hard today are on a gravy train compared to what folks used to have to go through. Why, back then, if they ever went anywhere, they had to walk, and if it was real cold, they would might near freeze. I've seen them going to a meeting, humped back and crippled and everything else. The women would have old rags wrapped around their heads, and they'd wrap up in quilts. They didn't have a sign of a coat. If it wasn't too cold, they would carry their shoes on their arm till they got pretty close to the meeting house. Then they'd sit down and put their shoes on, and when the meeting was over, they'd take them off and carry them to save wearing them out. Now, I'll swear that's the truth. I've seen that not just once or twice, but time and time again. 
hard times, I say hard times, there's a heap of folks today that don't know what hard times is. Chapter 14, Witches and Other Strange Happenings. Grandpap Stewart said it was the truth. I don't know whether or not witches ever existed, but after hearing Alex tell about them, I'm certain of one thing. If they ever did exist, they did so on Newman's Ridge in and around Grandpap Stewart's place. You told me a story once about an old man who ran a corn mill whose wife turned out to be a witch. How did that go? That was old Spot Collins. He lived about four or five miles from here over on Blackwater, and he put up the first grist mill that was ever in this community. Back then, they didn't understand gearing them up to where the stones would turn fast. They went awful slow, and it would take two or three hours to grind a turn of corn. They had to run night and day to do any good. Old man Spot Collins had four girls, Dosha, Lori, Kiri, and Carrie. They run the mill during the day, and he had a feller to come in about bedtime to run the mill at night. Spot went down there one morning early to take the miller his breakfast, and he was dead. There wasn't much said about it except that he died there, suddenly. After a while, Spot hired another feller to run the mill of a night, and it wasn't long before they found him dead, too. After that, Spot suspicioned something. About that time, there was an old circuit-riding Methodist preacher that come by and held a meeting at Spot's house. There wasn't no churches back then, and they would just meet in people's houses. Well, that old preacher, he wore a long scissor tail coat. He stayed there several days and preached of a night. Spot got to telling him about what had happened and that he couldn't get nobody to run the mill at night. Everybody was afraid. People was needing their corn ground to make bread, and so that old preacher agreed to run the mill a few nights till Spot could find somebody. He went down there the first night and started the mill up. It was powered by one of them old wooden water wheels. He poured the hopper full of corn and sat down on an old wooden bench to read his Bible while the corn ground. I've sat on that bench a thousand times, I guess, waiting for my turn of corn to be ground. He sat there a few minutes reading his Bible, and here come a cat. He had the mill locked so tight that a rat couldn't get in, and he didn't know how it got in. The cat came up and rubbed around his legs, meowed, and he spoke to it and asked it to have a seat. It jumped up on the bench and laid down with the old preacher. He went on reading his Bible, and in a little while, here come another cat and done the same way, laid down beside him. The preacher carried a great big hunting knife all the time, and he had it laying beside him. He'd heard the tales about the other two men dying, and he didn't know what might happen. All of a sudden, them two cats made a lunge at his throat, and he grabbed that knife, struck at one, and cut its foot off, and it fell to the floor. He looked down at it, and it was a woman's hand with a gold ring on one of her fingers. The next morning, Spot got up early and told his wife to get up and get them some breakfast while he went down to get the preacher. She said she'd get up in a minute, and he went on down to the mill. He asked the preacher how he got along, and he said, All right, I just had one little racket. Two cats jumped on me, and I struck and cut off a foot from one of them. That's it, laying over there. Spot went over and looked at it, and he said, That's my wife's hands. That's the ring I bought for her when we got married. They shut the mill down and went on up to the house to get breakfast. Spot's wife was still in bed. He told her again to get up, and she said, I feel bad. I'll, I'll get up directly. He said, I've been thinking you was a witch for a long time now, and now I know it. He said, Here's your hand. You get out of here and never come back made her leave before breakfast. A lot of people say that it don't look like it could be true, but Grandpap Stewart said it was the truth. You told me once about another witch that caused a lot of trouble, killed your grandfather's hogs, made the cows give bloody milk, and so forth. That was an old woman named Adeline Genzy. She went around the neighborhood a-begging and a-bumming. She'd come in at Grandpap's every two or three days at mealtime and sat down and eat a big bake. When she got through, she'd bum them out of some milk or butter or some meat, and then she would leave. One evening, she'd come by and eat supper, and then she asked Grandma could she have a quart of buttermilk to take with her. 
Grandma told her that her cow was just about dry and that they didn't have enough milk for her own family and that she just couldn't give her any. Well, that made old Adeline mad and she went off all puffed up. Grandpap had five big pretty hogs that run loose up in the woods above the house and two or three days after that old woman was there, one of the hogs died mysteriously. It come running off the hill just as hard as it could run, squealing like it was stuck. It run down in front of the house and run around and around three or four times and fell over dead. Grandpap said he took that hog out and buried it, and the next day, about the same time, here come another one that did the same thing. Fell over dead just like the first one. The third day, the exact same happened, and there was a woman there by the name of Janie Mullins. Grandpap was wondering what in the world had gone wrong with his hogs, and she told him they was witched. Grandpap said, Witched? I don't believe in no such stuff. She said, Go in the house and get me a butcher knife, and I'll show you that they're witched. Grandpap brought her a butcher knife, and she took it and cut that hog open and let its entrails fall out. Grandpap said them entrails started crawling around over one another on the ground just like a bunch of snakes. Said he never saw anything like it before or since. He said that put him to thinking. Old Lady Mullen said, Now there's a witch somewhere close by and she's got it in for you. She said, You've done something to make her mad and if you don't put a stop to her, she'll keep on and aggravate you to death. She'll kill every last one of your hogs, and then she'll cause your cow to give bloody milk, your horse to go blind, and all kinds of mischief. She'll get you out and ride you all night long all over the country, and just before the chickens start crowing for daylight, she'll ride you back home. You'll be more tired when you get up than when you, was, when you went to bed. Grandpap knowed in reason that it was old Adeline Jenzy doing the witching. Miss Mullins told Grandpap how to stop her. She says, you go down to the spring where she gets her water and find a good-sized tree that faces toward her house. Take your knife and cut out her picture on that tree as best you can, and then drive a nail in the part where you want her hurt. If you want her head hurt, drive the nail in her head. If you want her to break her neck, then you drive the nail in the neck, and so forth. Well, Grandpap didn't much believe in it, but he thought he'd try it anyhow. He slipped down to old Adeline Spring about dark that night and carved her picture on a buckeye tree and drove a nail in her knee. The very next day, she come out of her house right early and slipped and broke her leg. Grandpap never did have no more trouble with his hogs dying, nor with any kind of witching. Many people would never start digging a well without using a water witch to find the best place to dig. How did that work? Find you a witch hazel bush and get you a good sized fork off of it. Go out to where you're thinking of digging a well and walk around with that forked stick. You hold one of the forks in each hand and let the main prong point out in front of you and you put a dime on that end of the prong. Whenever you find an underground stream, that prong will point right straight down towards the ground. I don't care how tight you hold it, it will twist right out of your hand when you come across water. And the closer the water is to the top of the ground, and the more there is, the stronger the pull on that fork. There used to be an old man named Tom Prout that followed that. He had him a water witch, and he found water for people. He'd dig you a well, too, if you wanted him to. He'd walk around for half a day, sometimes, before he found the best place to dig one. Law, I've seen him do that many a time. So fascinating, again, for look into Alex as the days gone by that Alex likes to share about. Uh, really heartbreaking, the beginning of it, though. So heartbreaking about the, the way that people had to live in those days. We are, I mean, I agree with that when he says people today have a gravy train. I know that people, there's people that still suffer today. I have a gravy train. Maybe I should just say it that way. I have a gravy train compared to, to how Alex... <laughs> how he had to live but mostly his neighbors you can tell the differences which is really interesting even even in that poverty um you know i think about the woman in the tree sorry i hit the camera the woman in the tree how terrible to have to live in a tree and then to live in a cave but can you put yourself in her position i did for a minute not that i could understand i'm not saying that but when i think about living in a tree and then get moved up to a cave. I bet that cave was pretty nice. I mean, I bet she enjoyed being in the cave. The cave had to be warmer. It had to be, 
uh, safer from the elements, maybe safer from the animals and things like that. So th those parts are really, really hard to, to read. Um, I, I do think it's interesting about the food. You know, people had different favorites and different choices just like we do today. But about the possums and eating all those different things and but I like the part where he was talking about that there's not really, he was talking about eating polecats or a skunk. There's, there's really nothing as nasty as a chicken. That was something Pap said my whole life growing up. Of course, when he was growing up, they had lots of chickens and, you know, had to depend on them for eggs and for meat and for all those things. And I'm sure he had to take care of them a lot. And he would always say that, that there's nothing nastier than a chicken. And he didn't care for chicken. Granny liked it and, and we all liked it, but he, he didn't really like it at all. And he'd kind of fuss if we had that. And then later in his life, after I was married and had Corey and Katie, I remember one time he got sick and he swore it was chicken and swore that he would never eat it again after that. And I don't really think he did, not that, not that I know of. Uh, but he, that was something he always talked about when I was growing up, that chickens were the nastiest things. I like chicken, so I'm not saying that because I'm not a chicken eater. I am, but it just reminded me of really of Pap saying that. Another part in that uh, beginning that was kind of hard to read was about the poor man stealing for his family, you know, to eat. That's so, so sad that he had to, and then how terrible that the man, you can kind of, you know, see that he, he wanted to catch whoever was stealing his corn, but that was so sad. But then it, it turned out that then he become, you know, working for him, and, and, you know, Alex says then for the rest of his life, he trusted, Lou Trent trusted him with everything. But I like the, just one little word that jumped out at me that Alex said he was the choppinest man. We like to put the EST on a lot of words in Appalachia, whether you're the fightinest, the singinest, uh, the walkinest, just anything you can think about. But I, so I like that part when he was, when he was talking about being the choppinest man with an ax when he was cutting the wood for Lou Trent. Probably the worst part of that, that beginning part for me uh, all those hard things to read, so sad, thinking about people in that, but, um, which I shouldn't say this, but the one, the one that made me cringe the most is not like the chickens or, you know, the, or the nastiest animal that you can eat or the uh, nastiest bird, I guess you would say. Not that, or not even eating the polecat or the possums or any of that, but it's the man that eat the rats. That's my fear. I'm not really afraid of snakes. A lot of people ask me in my gardening videos, are you not afraid of snakes? Or do you ever see snakes? We do see snakes. And here where I live, we have the poisonous snakes that you have to worry about. We have copperheads and rattlesnakes, but they don't bother me. Um, most of the time snakes or, and then people ask about bears and stuff. Most of the time those things, if you kind of scoot them on, they'll go on and get out of your way. Uh, but even like the bears when we're in the woods, most of the time they hear you coming way before you ever, you don't even see them. They hear you coming and they skedaddle and go on. So none of those things bother me, but that's my fear is the rats. So the rats and the, and the mice, the scurrying, that's what I don't like. So I can't imagine the man that ate the rats, which is funny uh, that he, he didn't like them. He said they were too strong. So I guess that was the last rats that he ate. If you watched my video earlier this summer, I did one on purslane. So purslane is the same purse plant, purslant and pursley, though, that uh, Alex is talking about. So that's a plant that still grows in my area of Appalachia. I have it in pretty much in all my flower beds. It's edible for humans. It's one of those, not just hogs, but for humans, too. It's one of those ones, um, one of the plants they call a superfood because it is so vitamin rich. And if you missed that video, I can link to it so you can, you can check that out. Uh, another insight into kind of that the sadness of the just the poverty that they faced was that about the shoes you know when he was talking about people going to church how they would wait till they got almost to church even in the cold months and take and and then put their shoes on so they could go into the church with shoes on and then on the reverse when they were going home they'd just get I guess get out of the churchyard and then they'd take their shoes off and that was to save their shoes because they knew that they wouldn't have that many. You know, they wanted to save them for that special thing. Now, I can't even imagine that because, of course, in my lifetime, I've not just had one pair of shoes. I have multiple pairs of shoes. If you're like me, I have sandals and, and then I have boots for winter and I, I have a pair of tennis shoes and I have a pair of gardening shoes. You know, I have some dress shoes that I might wear with a dress. So I have ample, ample shoes. Um, I was raised kind of, Granny and Pap would raise us to kind of like, I, I would get a new pair of shoes, a pair of tennis shoes for school, 
and I just saved those for school or to go to town or something like that, but I didn't wear them outside. I kept those nice, uh, in other words, and then I had an old pair. I wore my old ones outside, but that's the, that's the closest I can even come to imagining that, and that really doesn't compare because I still had multiple pairs of shoes. And then the very ending of it, the dowsing for um, water, I'm very familiar with that. I've heard people talk about it all my life. I've never heard the part where Alex talks about putting a dime on the um, kind of the fork of the twig or whatever they were using. I've never heard that part, but I've heard a lot of people talk about dowsing and they really believe in it. And I've seen some examples of people where they're just walking and the, the, it does kind of, they feel a pull, it does pull down. Uh, so those, that's really fascinating. Another aspect of dousing like that for water is that there's people that say that they can douse for graves. Well, you think, well, why would you be dousing for a grave? Well, in, um, think about in the Smoky Mountain National Park or other parks or anything like that, wilderness, where there's a wilderness now. But if, there used to, if you know where there used to be an old home place, well, in those days, a lot of times they buried people near the homes instead of, you know, maybe at the, your church cemetery or, or the community or... Uh, memorial down the road where they you know where people are interned so uh, sometimes people would say that they could douse for that I mean there are, are people that actually say they can so they might douse for a grave near an old home, old home site where people are maybe wondering where Aunt um, you know Sadie or Uncle Joseph or whoever they have kind of written down that they were buried there but no one it's been lost through the annals of time you know as time went on no one remembers exactly where that was because of course the landscape looks different and the people are gone uh, that, that actually knew exactly where it was at but so that's that's a fascinating thing to think of that chapter I'm sure it'll have more stories about things like that in it because we just started it so you'll have to have to tune in next time to see what other kind of things like that whether it's more witches or what it is that Alex talks about if he talks about any ghosts or any haints as we would say or any kind of supernatural stuff so please leave a comment and let me know what jumped out at, uh, at you when you heard this part of the reading and as always, I do hope you'll drop back by next Friday so we can see what else happens in this uh, supernatural kind of chapter here. And we're, we're getting closer every week, but we do have a little bit more to go. So please drop back by next Friday.